Thank you very much, uh, Tony. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I want to start by thanking Finn Tarp, who uh, convinced us to have this panel today. It is going to be a preview of what's to come, because what I'm going to be discussing, as well as my co-panelists, is a project that we have in the Journal of Economic Inequality to uh, produce a special issue which is going to be devoting, devoted to appraising, assessing existing databases on inequality. And uh, let's see here, they told me I have to do something different because it's a... All right. So this is uh, my, my co-conspirator who couldn't be here today because he has to deal with more important things as chief economist for sub-Saharan Africa at the World Bank is Chico Ferreira. Many know him very well. And I also want to refer to uh, our research assistant who's a PhD student at Tulane University. And the databases that we included in this, uh, in this project are nine. They're not all. In fact, we did not include two of the ones that are going to be presented tomorrow, I think. So it's going to be interesting because hopefully this will be the beginning of a process rather than the end of uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, we hope to have it published online by the end of 2014, early 2015. And uh, so today's presentation is a preview. You get the dress rehearsal, so to speak. Uh, so let me start by telling you why I think that this kind of assessment is not only uh, desirable but necessary. And I want to tell you uh, sort of a, some anecdotal evidence how this, uh, the idea of having this special issue came about. I mean, I, over the years, have been very, very, always very concerned with the fact that we have inconsistent data depending on the sources on what's happening to poverty and inequality, and not just that, many other fronts. But in particular, it has always worried me the fact that you can come up with very different narratives, especially you know, if you ask the question, what's going to happen, what happened to countries during a crisis, you often can come up with different narratives if you use different sources. And I think that's very dangerous, both from the point of view of just knowledge creation, but even from the policy implications of what you learn from that information. Uh, the anecdote is that you know, the idea started, Chico and I were at a panel at Yale University organized by former President Cedillo who, from Mexico, who, who is now the director of a center there. It was on Latin America, and we were just uh, having a panel with, uh, you know, you were not there and there, but we were talking about the same things that you talked about today, but the declining inequality in Latin America, how great it was and how happy we were. And somebody raised their hand and said, but you know what? The IMF says that uh, uh, decline in, the decline in inequality in sub-Saharan Africa is more prominent than the one in Latin America. So Chico and I looked at each other and said, what's that? We never heard of that. What kind of data? Uh, the person who raised his hand, by the way, was the former president of the Central Bank in Chile, very well-respected economist, Pepo de Gregorio, so we took it seriously. And so I went back to look at the data, and uh, this was uh, in the fiscal monitor. It was not uh, in the paper that Andy presented today. The fiscal monitor is a report that the IMF produces regularly. And yes, the data that they had there showed that inequality had declined in a number of African countries. And then I said, well, let me go and check where the POFCAL, I went to the World Bank database. I thought they were using the World Bank database, and there I saw that the numbers were very different. And so I went back, I talked to people at the IMF, I said, well, where does this data come from? And they told me it came from uh, Frederick Saltz database, which is, uh, as uh, Andy uh, described it today, primarily imputed data based on some existing data, but all of it is imputed. Uh, all the data that is in that database is imputed. So I started asking a little more, but then I said, well, I don't, I mean, this is imputed. I know nothing about imputation methods, so 
who am I to say whether it's right or wrong? I said, well, let's, let's go for it and let's have an assessment of databases, but let's have them of most or all, that the, one, the ones that we're using uh, generally, so that we can have a go at what's going on with these databases. We tend to use them a little blindly, all of us do, because you know, we want to use the data. Uh, we're not data producers, and you know, we don't want to have to spend a lot of time on what's behind this data. And we say, well, great, if there is something that tells us what's happened to the Gini coefficient before and after government taxes and transfers, I mean, how, you know, how, that's heaven for most of us if we can do that. So anyway, we thought this was going to be a good public good, and we invited a bunch of people. At first, I thought it was going to be just a forum section of the journal, and then Chico said at that time he was the editor, no, 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 let's do the whole issue. So that's how this started. So we, uh, the first thing that I am showing you here is we distinguish between three categories of the data sets, the micro database data sets, the ones that use secondary sources, and the ones that use imputation. So in total, we have nine. And uh, so which are they and who are their reviewers? We have CEPAL-STAT, which is produced by the UN, the reviewers Francois. In blue are the ones that you're going to hear from today. Uh, IDD is Income Distribution Database from the OECD. It's been reviewed by Leonardo Gasparini and Leopoldo Tornaroli. LIS, Martin Ravalion did a review of LIS. POFCAL, World Development Indicators, which is a World Bank. Tim Smeeting and John Latner. And um, SEDLAC, which is uh, the one that Andrea used, as he referred today, used for, for his uh, edited volume, and I use a lot as well. Uh, and the World Top Incomes Database, um, that uh, Andrea Brandolini is uh, writing the review for. So um, from one to five, they're microdata household surveys. The last one is the one that uses tax returns, as we all heard today. Then the secondary source base are all the genies produced by Branko Milanovic and uh, with our host. And the imputation space is SWID, that although it uses the same acronym, I think we're going to hear today it's not really only WID, and uh, we don't know exactly if they're cousins, third cousins, or nothing. Andrea says nothing. Uh, but uh, Stephen Jenkins is going to discuss SWID and WID. OK. So if you want to know where they're based institutionally, you can go and look at my slides. I uh, think that some are UN, World Bank, uh, OECD, and some are private uh, uh, initiatives that are funded by, by foundations primarily. So which databases are not included here and worth mentioning? The UTIP uh, project by, by um, by Galbraith, who I don't know if he's here already. I think it was, I saw it on the program. I think it's going to be tomorrow, or is it no longer on the program? I don't remember. So he will, uh, he has a very nice uh, data set that they're put together. Then the Genie project, by the time we um, started working on this, it was not available. Then this is my website, and I excluded it, not because it's mine. It's I'm, I'm willing to be subject to the same scrutiny, but we had not really started posting it until uh, recently, and it has only very few observations. And then there's a new one that I think also is going to be presented here, the Global Consumption and Income Project. So we asked the uh, reviewers to sort of follow uh, playbook in which you know they could uh, use these criteria as a guide accessibility and user friendly quality of documentation reliability accuracy of reported indicators and transparency and replicability which I think are very important when we are dealing with uh, data sets so how many this, these are the, the uh, data points country years with primary source data so there are about 1346 this uh, are the regions, the regional breakdown, and also because in some cases you have more than one 
source database producing the same results, meaning the same results for the same country in the same year, but not necessarily the same indicator, you have more in the second column, in particular because Latin America and the Caribbean has essentially two main initiatives that produce data for Latin America, CEPAL, the UN, and CEDLAC. Okay, so what do we want to know about the databases? Most of us, when we're working uh, on something that needs information on inequality and poverty, we want to know which indicators, what's the country coverage, what's the period coverage. However, uh, you know, more sophisticated users also want to know which welfare indicator, if you use income or consumption, per capita or equivalized, total or monetary, which makes a lot of difference, by the way, <laughs> depending on whether you use a measure that has imputed rent for owners occupied housing and auto consumption can change, can change the sign of the direction of a Gini coefficient, for example. Before or after taxes or transfers, you also may want to know statistical significance of what's put out. Um, then do you want to know probably if the income concepts are homogenized, which is the reason that Andrea gave earlier today for choosing CEDLAC over CEPAL, indicators calculation from unit records or group data, uh, are regional price differentials taken into account? By the way, I discovered that some are doing it without that being so obvious in the, uh, on the face of it. Uh, what's the definition of household? So, and in particular, in uh, my case, I always want to know what did they do to the data, uh, the data adjustments. And in my case, because of Latin America, and I'll show you why, I'm particularly interested what do they do with the underreporting problem, particularly the underreporting problem at the top. Do they correct? Do they not correct? How do they do it? But then you have top coding, treatment of extreme values and zeros, or even negative incomes. And then, you know, if you are someone who is working particularly in a particular country, you also may want to know some more information about the survey, the sample design, the questions they use, the recall period, are they comparable across countries and over time, and uh, it, is it possible to have access to the microdata, which I think from all this group, the only one that gives you that op uh, option is actually LIS. LIS, the Luxembourg, formerly known as Luxembourg Income Study Project, now its main, main, main objective is not to produce data, but to produce uh, homogenized microdata that uh, researchers can use remotely. You know? Okay, so give me a little bit, let me give you a little bit of highlights. You know, one, one surprising thing is not the indicators tend to be more or less the same, uh, but uh, not very, not all of them, not all of the databases that use microdata uh, report statistical significance, which was a surprise because I thought, you know, there was a standard uh, measure. I'm going to give you just a preview of the kind of things that you're going to hear. Uh, when you look at whether they use income or consumption, these are, the, again, the micro data based uh, surveys. Practically all use income. The only one that has some consumption, some income, is the POFCAL World Development Indicators. All the others have income because that's what you get in many, many countries, in particular in Latin America. It's much more common to have income-based surveys. Um, then, you know, I was interested, because I'm working now on tax incidents and transfer incidents, do they include estimates before taxes and transfers, uh, before and after? Well, it turns out that even though there are two that have it before, there's only one that produces results systematically. Again, this is a micro database, okay? Before and after, which is the OECD. Um, differences in prices by region looks like the only one that's doing it is at LAC, and I didn't know that until I asked, but they deflate all the rural, uh, all the rural incomes by, by, I think, 10 or 15 percent. By, by definition, to get the rural uh, poverty and inequality estimates. Then, in terms of the treatment of the data, do they correct around the reporting? Well, uh, looks like uh, the one that definitely do, does it and almost systematically is CEPAL. 
Then there is some of it in the OECD and the world tip, top incomes uh, data. Now, is documentation sufficient to replicate results? And that's one of the things that probably made Andrea and me stay away sometimes from using CEPAL, because you cannot, you don't have the documentation to know exactly what was done to every one of the data that are being used to calculate the inequality indicators. And the only one that gives you access to microdata, as I said, is, uh, yes. All right, so let me, let me now focus on SWID, which, uh, like I said, was inspiration to, to do this to do this, uh, I am no expert on imputation methods, like I said, I probably will never be. So, but I wanna know, is the description of imputation methods sufficient to replicate? Yes, it's so well documented that Dan Tellis, our RA, was able to replicate all the information that, that Sol produces, we know how to do it. Then, you know, I asked the question, well, has it been, the method been subject to scrutiny by experts in the field of imputation? For me, that's not clear enough because the journal where this got published doesn't seem to be a journal where you have that expertise. So in order for me to say, I am going to use that data, I want the experts to tell me, yes, the method is acceptable. Is there a systematic validation process in place with experts on countries and regions? Again, to me, it's not clear. I hear anecdotes, people saying, oh, you know, for the, Facundo Alvaredo from the top income says, no, but the data on the top incomes doesn't make sense. But there's no systematic, at least from my perspective, uh, validation. I also don't know exactly how the Gini coefficients for income before taxes and transfers are calculated. I think that the, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I wrote Salt, but, but he hasn't responded yet. I'd like to know what method he used. Oh, by the way, this is, you know, the sources used by secondary and imputed data sets. You can also see uh, what uh, people use to generate the, the various data sets. All right, so let me give you some previews of the things that always obsess me <laughs> as a concern. Okay, we have CEPAL and CEDLAC. There's a large overlap. This is all Latin America and the Caribbean, by the way, only. Large overlap, lots of countries and, they, and years overlap. They both calculate Gini coefficients directly for microdata. The important difference in terms of methodology, CEPAL corrects for underreporting in a way that is, you know, reasonable, one could think. Uh, but we only know the general uh, method. And, uh, you know, I can go into that if you want during the, uh, the questions and answers. So how likely is this difference? of affecting our analysis of levels and trends in inequality in Latin America. The results are similar in terms of trends, uh, and the data points are quite correlated. However, the inequality levels, as expected, because CEPAL corrects particularly for underreporting at the top, tend to be systematically and significantly higher in CEPAL, which is not correct for underreporting. And, um, since it's not well documented, like I said, I cannot replicate it, I cannot compare. So if you take the difference between the CEPAL genie minus the CEDLAC genie, that's what you get. And the average difference is the red line. So you'll always find most of the Latin American countries to be much more unequal if you use CEPAL. And in some instances, also if you look at specific data, you can get trends in opposite direction. some cases. Well, what about list key figures versus OECD? They're also highly correlated. Nevertheless, when you zoom into a particular country a year, there can be important differences. As you can see here, this is OECD Gini minus list Gini. Okay, so you do have differences, which when you're looking at a particular country for a particular period, they can affect your results, and that's what concerns me, okay? Two minutes. All right. So what about SWIFT versus others? You know, general trends look fairly similar, and that's why I am going to ask Stephen maybe later to comment on whether, even if when looking at particular countries, particular years, the results can be misleading, 
Can you use this for regression analysis? And I'm going to leave it at that. But when you zoom in, for example, this is SWID minus the width, net G. So SWID tends to give lower estimates than, and all the points there mean discrepancies, okay? Either above or below. And uh, this is Povkal and Sweet. There are also, also quite a bit of discrepancies. But let me go to this table. I have two tables that I want to show, and then I finish. This was the source of the inspiration for the special issue. So I went back and I said, okay, let me grab the bunch of the countries for Africa and take the, they, they were comparing 90s and 2000s. That was the argument uh, primarily, I think, by the IMF. Let me take the uh, earliest point and the latest point that was in this report and compare POVCAL with uh, the IMF fiscal monitor based on Sweden. Um, turns out that, you know, we have nine countries here. Four out of the nine, <clears throat> if you use POVCAL, inequality increased, and in Sweden it decreased. So in four out of nine cases, you would give a different story completely, not only in terms of levels, but trends. So that's scary, okay? Then, you know, I started uh, corresponding with, well, I mean, this is comparisons for Indonesia. Sweden is uh, the, the little points, black, and this is Jamaica. This, you know, these are the countries that have a lot of uh, differences depending on the source, but uh, you know, when, when I started asking, so, so what's, what's going on? Why do we have such differences between Povkal and, and, and Sweet? So Fred Salt was kind enough and sent me this, Kenya confidence interval in Sweet, and then I said, okay, so you know, if you start by one extreme of the confidence, and then on the other extreme of the confidence, you would probably get an increase in inequality and not a decline. Uh, therefore, really, you can tell within the percentage points that we're looking at whether it was an increase or a decline using this data set. Finally, you know, I also looked at the measuring the redistributive effect by, by uh, because that's, that's, you know, that's quite fascinating. If you have a number of countries for which for many years you can check the receptive effect, and I compared it to our project, Commitment to Equity, in which we do very, if you want, country-based, careful fiscal incidence analysis. And this is what I found. Sweden is the change in the Gini uh, from before and after uh, taxes and transfers is the red. In the CEQ, the Commitment to Equity uh, project, these are the countries for which we can do the comparison at this point. You can see the difference between the two. And in this case, in four out of 14 countries, you would get a different result. Uh, and the difference, when I say different, I mean, well, in percentage points, it's very large, the difference, or relative to the redistributive change is very different, or even like in Sri Lanka, we get the opposite results. In 4 and 14, again, it's a very high ratio if you're trying to use information. And this is just an example of 14 countries. I don't know how that affects the results of Andy and his co-authors, which, by the way, I love the results. <laughs> you know, it's uh, the results we all like. Uh, but I think it you know, makes us pause in terms of how to use this information and how much to be confident about what we obtain uh, in terms of results both when we focus on particular countries or when we do these cross-section regression analysis. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me a couple of minutes more, or maybe oh, more, I don't know. Oh, yeah.